Hi everyone, uh, welcome back to Communication Networks for Power Systems. Uh, this is our lecture two, where we'll continue our discussion of fundamentals of communication networks. Let's shift our focus now to analog versus digital signals. Uh, analog signal is one in which the magnitude of frequency can vary continuously over a range of variables. Think of a voice signal. You can continuously change the frequency, which is a tone, or the magnitude, which is the volume. As opposed to this, we have digital signals that vary between discrete levels. Uh, the easiest way would be to think of it as binary 0 and 1, which is represented as a um, 0 volt for binary 0 and let's say 5 volts for uh, binary 1. Now, in an ideal world, you would want to transmit analog signals through analog transmission systems and digital signals through digital transmission systems. That's because every time you convert a signal from one form to another, there will be losses associated with that. Uh, in practice, however, this is not possible. So there are different situations in which it is better to transmit a signal as analog. In certain situations, it's better to transmit as digital. The benefit of analog over digital transmission is that analog signals consume less bandwidth than digital. The reason for this is that uh, in digital transmission, you are trying to transmit a, a rectangular pulse like this. Um, and if you uh, recall from Fourier series, a pulse is essentially, or any function for that matter, but pulse included, is a summation of a lot of different sine and cosine functions. Um, if you want to get very close to the shape of the pulse, especially representing these sharp edges, you would have to have a lot of high frequency components in order to get close to that value. If you consider only the fundamental, this is what you're going to get. If you add fundamental and third, this is what you will get. Um, first and third and fifth is going to give you something like this. So the more frequencies you add, it'll get closer to the shape of the pulse but not exactly uh, those sharp edges. For these sharp edges, you would have to have very high frequency components, which means uh, digital pulses would, would take more bandwidth. However, digital transmission has uh, the benefit of its own. Um, you can do data compression, which is quite uh, useful for larger data sets. We can have encryption for added cybersecurity, and of course, digital data uh, is less susceptible to noise. Uh, now, you may be familiar with modems. Uh, modem, in fact, stands for modulate, demodulate. That's a device that allows us to take uh, digital data, as shown here, uh, convert it to analog, send it as analog, and then demodulate it back to digital at the receiving end. Counterpart of that is codec, uh, which stands for code and decode. Uh, so here you have an analog signal but you now code it as digital pulses, send it through a digital transmission network, and then at the receiving end, uh, you will decode it back to um, its original analog form. Let's talk about bandwidth for these two types of signals. For analog signals, bandwidth is defined as a range of frequencies that can be transmitted without being strongly attenuated. Uh, now, that strongly attenuated is a little bit subjective. So in engineering, we have decided for acceptable attenuation to be anything less than 50%. So if you have this uh, signal that you're sending, consider this diagram here, let's say um, you have a signal power shown here. If you lose up to 50% of that power, you might still be okay because what you receive at the receiving end might still be acceptable. Uh, but we're assuming that if you lose more than 50% of the power uh, in the signal, uh, then the signal received at the receiving end is not acceptable. Now, oftentimes we uh, take this to um, decibel, um, basically, form, and we say uh, 10, if you recall from our discussion last time, uh, log of P out to P in. And if this is 1 half, meaning that you have lost 50% of the signal, the value, if you recall, is negative 3 dB. So in decibel, when the attenuation is anything uh, larger than 3 dB, then that, that indicates that more than 50% of the power is lost, um, and this is not acceptable. So oftentimes what we do is when we uh, 
uh, plot the power versus frequency, notice that the vertical axis is power and horizontal axis is frequency. Um, the range of frequencies uh, whose attenuation is less than negative 3 dB, those frequencies go through um, you know, uh, successfully. And the rest of the frequencies, those that have attenuation more than 3 dB, um, are assumed to be attenuated too much to be useful at the receiving end. So in this case, for example, we say that this is this range of frequencies are frequencies that go through without um, too much attenuation. So that's the um, maximum bandwidth that that channel can provide for us. Uh, bandwidth is really a property of the communication medium. Um, and especially in, in wired systems, it depends on the thickness of the medium or its length. Um, it is true that we want to get as much bandwidth as possible through a medium. However, keep in mind uh, that sometimes we intentionally reduce the bandwidth. Uh, this could be because, uh, for instance, high frequency components, sending them through a channel may be completely useless because the channel, uh, which is essentially a wire channel, is, is a line, is a conductor and has inductance associated with it in high frequencies it acts as a filter and filters out those components anyway um, another reason is sending high frequency components is actually more expensive because you need faster electronics for that uh, so for some for some of these reasons uh, we in fact sometimes try to limit the bandwidth that we send through a channel um, before we do that uh, for digital signals, bandwidth is uh, mainly defined in bit rates, which is the number of bits that can be sent through that channel per second. Um, the typical units that we use is in units of kilobit per second, megabit per second, or gigabit per second, which is 1,000 bits per second, 1 million, or 1 billion. Now, I need to make a note here to clarify what we mean when we talk about uh, kilobits or kilobytes, for example. Uh, following SI units, uh, whenever someone uses uh, the prefix of kilo, uh, the first thing that comes to your mind is a thousand. Um, in practice, however, a thousand or likewise million and billion are not very easy to show in binary. So usually instead of that, uh, instead of a thousand, we often use two to the power of 10 which is 1,024. Um, this is actually a typo. It should be 1,024. Um, and then for uh, mega, we use 2 to the power of 20, which is 1,048,576. Um, so this could cause a little bit of confusion because now when you say kilobits, for example, uh, your audience may not know whether you're talking about 1,000 or 1,024, likewise for megabit or gigabit. So to avoid this confusion, in late 90s, the IEC um, introduced some uh, binary prefixes uh, that have the term B or, or the words B after that. So when you say kibibit or kibibit, you're, you're actually saying I'm uh, referring to 1,024 and not 1,000. Similarly, we have uh, mebibyte and gibibyte and tebibyte and so on. Uh, just keep in mind uh, that this, these two kind of different ranges, whether a thousand or a thousand twenty-four, um, and likewise for mega and giga, these are used for uh, memory and not for data rate. In data rate, every time that someone says kilobit per second or megabit per second, they are in fact referring to a thousand or a million bits uh, per second. Uh, continuing uh, with our discussion of bandwidth for digital signals, um, we saw that uh, bandwidth is defined in terms of number of bits per second. Um, we can actually increase the bandwidth uh, through a medium by sending more than one bit uh, at each pulse. So if you recall in the previous discussion, I mentioned that, for example, you could have, uh, you could send a one and a zero and a one and another one and so on. Uh, so this time at every um, pulse of the clock, you basically send one bit, either a one or a zero. Now, one thing that we can do is we can use levels in between. Recall that in order to send zero, you send a, a voltage of zero volts. And for one, you send a voltage of five volts. What if I use the values in between? So what if in, in addition to uh, 
uh, 0 and 5, I also use 1 volt and 3 volts. Um, so here could mean that, for instance, if I send 0 volts, that means I'm sending 2 bits of 0. If I use 1 volt, this is a 1, uh, I'm sending 2 bits, 1 is 0, 1 is 1. For 3 volts, I'm sending uh, 1 and 0. And for 5 volts, I'm sending 1 and 1. Here, as I'm showing in this diagram, for example, you can see that you can double the bit rate because now at every tick of the pulse, you will actually send two bits instead of one. Um, to differentiate between that and the pulses that I mentioned before, we often use the term baud or baud rate. Uh, this indicates the number of symbols transmitted per second. So each of these, this one, this one, this one, and this one, each of them is a symbol and not just a bit because notice that in this case, each symbol represents two bits. Um, and in this hypothetical example, you can see uh, that we are sending four symbols per second. So this is a one second time frame, uh, four symbols per second. Uh, but uh, during this one second time, I have in fact uh, transmitted eight bits, uh, two here, two here, two and two. So uh, I have four symbols per second of baud rate, which is eight per bit per second of bit rate. Um, as you can imagine, this of course is, is very positive because it can increase um, the bit rate. Uh, the downside, however, is that detection at the receiving end could be more problematic. The reason is if I'm uh, transmitting uh, just a two level binary system between zero volts and five volts, what I will receive at the receiving end is not going to look like a you know neat pulse like this. It's going to be like a, a little bit distorted signal that um, you, you may receive something like this. For example, imagine this is five volts and this is a pulse you get. If you're only doing binary zero and one, so either zero volts or five volts, when you get this message, you will say, okay, this is most likely a five volt pulse that I'm getting this uh, distorted version. And you um, interpret this, this uh, value, this signal as a five volt message, which is a binary one. However, if you're using all these different values, these levels of one volt and three volt and so on, when you get this distorted signal, it's not really clear, um, was it intended to indicate five volts or three volts, for example. So the uh, impact of noise on the accuracy of the signal or um, rather the accuracy of detecting the signal at the receiving end uh, would increase and that could uh, result in incorrect detection of pulses. Um, a little bit of uh, numerical values that are used a lot in communication engineering. So historically, voice data, which is analog, in order to, to digitize it, we sample it 8,000 times a second. Uh, and each sample we encode it as a byte, which consists of eight bits. So 8,000 samples a second, each one being eight bits, that gives us 64 kilobit per second. Uh, we call this the basic unit of communication. We will later on see that the basic unit of communication for fiber optics is actually different, uh, but this is uh, for uh, copper communication media. Um, so based on this now, we define three categories. Narrow band is a single channel with a bit rate of 64 kilobit per second or up to 24 channels with that capacity, which will give us 1.54 megabit per second. Anything above 1.544 and up to 45 megabit per second in the US or above two and below 34 megabit per second internationally is known as wideband. And anything above 45 megabit per second in the US or 34 megabit per second internationally that is known as broadband. Let's move on uh, to discussion of serial versus parallel communication. There are two ways and we can send digital data. Uh, in serial communication, you only have a single channel. Look at the upper diagram here. There is one channel that connects the sender to the receiver um, and it transfers information one bit at a time. Uh, you can send the most significant bit first or the least significant bit first. Both of them uh, exist. Um, as opposed to this, we can have parallel communication. Uh, here, uh, you will have at least 
eight channels that are parallel with one another, and each one would send uh, the bit uh, associated with it. So you can see that uh, the bits B0, B1, B2, all the way to B7, all of them are sent at the same time. Of course, uh, in reality, you need more than eight channels because you need channels for for a clock, for a gram, for, and for other things. Uh, now, you might think that uh, parallel communication is uh, basically increasing uh, data rate by, by a factor of eight. That's not exactly the case because as you um, have multiple channels in parallel with one another, you're going to have crosstalk between them. So this interference, is, which especially happens at higher frequencies, basically limits the frequency at which we can transmit data. So we can't really and necessarily get to eight times the data rate that we have for uh, for serial communication. The other issue is the issue of synchronization. At very high speeds, uh, it's very difficult to make sure that all these channels, all these eight channels or whatever number of channels we have, all of them change state exactly at the same time. So because of this, uh, there are some limitations with the highest speed that we can get uh, with parallel communication. Serial communication in general, is the de facto way to uh, to transmit data for for long long distance communication as well as computer networking um, and it's uh, even for short distance communication it's uh, becoming a lot more uh, commonplace com compared to parallel communication because of uh, the issues i mentioned now let's talk about uh, metrics for uh, quantifying network performance. One of the most important metrics is availability. This is the same as reliability as is used in engineering systems. But as we talked about it last time, uh, reliability in communication engineering can have a very different meaning, which is presence or absence of acknowledgments. So in order to avoid confusion, I only use the term availability here. What we typically go for is five nines, uh, which means that the communication network has to be operational and available 99.999% of the time, uh, which corresponds to only being unavailable at most six minutes in one year. Um, this is especially important uh, because a communication network is a cyber physical system. You have communication channels and uh, devices such as routers and switches that would have to get uh, upgraded at, at times. Uh, there is uh, based on, for example, new software patches that become available uh, or any, any other you know, relevant updates and upgrades. It is important to make sure that during this time, the system remains uh, operational. And there is in fact a, uh, a type of upgrade that is known as hitless upgrade uh, in which um, when the device is uh, undergoing software update, it's not going to go out of service and it will continue sending and receiving data. Um, another metric is bandwidth delay product. Um, this is defined as the multiplication of bandwidth in bits per second and round trip delay in seconds. Uh, this round trip delay, and this is something that we're gonna talk about later on, but just to give you a feel, if you have a sender and a receiver, uh, when the sender sends a packet to the receiver, it takes a time for the packet to get to the receiver. Once the receiver receives the packet, it sends an acknowledgement. So because of that, we call this entire thing round trip delay. Uh, bandwidth delay product um, is actually more useful um, in terms of quantifying how the network is performing compared to bandwidth alone because the fact that we're looking at the delay gives us some idea about the level of congestion in the network. Another important uh, metric for network performance is throughput, which is defined as the rate of successful messages that are delivered over a communication channel. Um, this is a function of both the hardware as well as the medium of, of the communication network. Um, and it is really determined based on the throughput of the weakest link. So wherever you have a bottleneck, whether it be it a, um, a router, a switch, or a communication link, that is the element, the, the entity that will determine the overall throughput of uh, the entire system. Um, another metric which is kind of related to throughput is bit error rate, uh, which is defined as the number of bits received in error uh, to the total number of bits that uh, are received 
Um, modern communication networks have very low bit error rates. Uh, these are two examples. Radio links have a bit error rate of typically less than 10 to the power of minus 6, and optical links less than 10 to the power of minus 12. Uh, Why these numbers are very, very small and might make us excited, uh, you have to remember that there is a large number of bits that are sent over a channel at every second. So 10 to the power of minus 6, if you multiply it by 1 megabit per second, uh, that means you're going to have one bit of error per second. If it's one gigabit per second uh, for that channel, that's a thousand bits in error per second. So uh, don't judge these small numbers in isolation. Always take a look at the bit error rate uh, in conjunction uh, with the data rate. So how many bits are put uh, on the channel? Uh, we also have uh, the notion of quality of service. There are different ways you can define quality of service. Um, the most uh, common categories are bandwidth, delay, jitter, and packet loss. Uh, bandwidth, as I mentioned, is the range of frequencies that will go through without attenuation or the bit rate that we have for digital channels. Delay is the duration of time it takes for the signal uh, to go from the sender to the receiver end. Jitter is the variation in standard deviation in delay, and packet loss, of course, is the number of packets, the rate of packets that are lost in communication. And we will talk a lot more about packet loss when we discuss network layer. Uh, kind of related to this is uh, quality of experience, uh, which is a little bit of a subjective metric uh, that takes into account the overall acceptability of a service um, as it's perceived by the end user. And typically, um, if you improve quality of service, quality of experience will improve as well, although the relationship may not be necessarily linear. Another way to classify signals is in terms of baseband and passband. Baseband is a signal that occupies a range of frequencies from zero to a maximum value. Um, as I am showing it here. Passband, on the other hand, is a, is a signal in which it has been shifted to a higher range of frequencies. Um, so you could have, for example, a baseband signal shifted to higher ranges of frequencies and you get a passband signal. Uh, baseband signals are used uh, for wire transmission mainly. Uh, passband, on the other hand, for optical transmission or wireless transmissions. And there's a very important uh, reason, or rather multiple reasons for it. Uh, one of the reasons is that if you have a channel and you want to share it between multiple users, uh, all of them, uh, for example, if, if you have a lot of voice signals, all of them would typically occupy the same range of frequencies. So obviously, if you add all of them uh, with the same frequencies to the channel, they will corrupt one another, they will garble one another. Um, so we will shift each one to a different range of frequencies. And again, this is something that we'll discuss a lot more when we get to the topic of modulation. So that's one reason for converting baseband signals to passband. Um, another important uh, reason is that uh, if you want to transmit signals over wireless channels, you have to sometimes increase the frequency. Otherwise, the size of antenna that is needed for transmitting and receiving the signal is not going to be practical. As a rule of thumb, if you want to transmit a signal with frequency f, you need an antenna with length of one half of lambda, lambda being the wavelength for that particular frequency. So now as an exercise, let's see what that means exactly. Human voice um, has signals around the frequency range of three kilohertz. It could be you know, higher or lower for certain people, but that's typically the average value. Now, uh, calculate the size of antenna that is required if we wanted to transmit voice signal directly, so not converting it to a passband signal at higher frequencies. Um, what I would like you to do is to pause the video at this point, think about this, work through this example, and then when you're ready, hit play. All right, let's let's uh, do this exercise. So uh, just like in mechanics, you're familiar with the equation x 
distance equals V speed times T, and we can uh, apply it to electromagnetic waves. So we have lambda wavelength is C speed of light times period, or instead of that, I will show it as one over frequency. So that will be C over F. Uh, now consider I want to uh, send this signal at three kilohertz range of frequency directly using an antenna. Wavelength for that signal is going to be speed of light, which is three times 10 to the power of eight, divided by three kilohertz, which is three times 10 to the power of three. So that's 10 to the power of five meters, which is 100 kilometers. The size of the antenna required for this transmission is lambda two over two, which is 50 kilometers. So you need an antenna, which is 50 kilometers long, which obviously this is not going to be practical. Um, on the other hand, if we wanted to uh, convert this, you know, relatively lower frequency from three kilohertz, let's say, shift it to a, a passband signal, let's say at a range of four megahertz, which is typical for video bandwidth. Um, let's see what the size of the uh, antenna would be in that case. So lambda in that case is going to be three times 10 to the power of eight divided by uh, four times 10 to the power of uh, six. And that's basically um, 0.75 times 100, which is 75. So the size of the antenna is going to be 32.5 meters, uh, which is, I'm sorry, uh, 37.5 meters, uh, which is now a lot more reasonable uh, compared to 50 kilometers. So that's another reason why when you have a um, baseband signal at low frequency, you shift it to higher frequencies uh, and make it a passband. And how we do this shift, uh, this is an important and fundamental aspect of modulation, which we will discuss when we get to uh, our discussion on network architecture. All right, before we move on to network architecture, which is a uh, one of the most important topics uh, in today's lecture and also in overall in this course, uh, let's um, review some other acronyms that are quite important. Um, we, when we talk about network scale, we define different types of networks depending on their ra range of coverage. Uh, we have personal area networks that cover personal space within the range of one meter. We have local area networks or wireless local area networks that could cover individual rooms or buildings or for example, an entire campus. We have metropolitan area networks that cover cities and wide area networks that could cover countries or the entire continent. Um, there have been other acronyms that um, have been defined for, de for specific types of applications. For example, HAN for home area network, BAN for building area network, we have CAN for campus area network, FAN for field area network, and NAN for neighborhood area network. Uh, more related to our focus, which is power systems and the smart grid, local area networks can be implemented uh, to cover a building automation system, a home automation system, for example, a home energy management system, or an industrial operation uh, automation system within a factory. Neighborhood area networks uh, are networks uh, that cover a relatively small neighborhood. Um, and this is uh, could be viewed as a special type of a field area network. Field area network um, is essentially a an area which is remote from from the utilities core network, but at some point it connects to that core network. And it would, um, for example, uh, could consist of a long distribution line with multiple transformers and other devices, um, or for example. Uh, multiple substations, for instance. And then we have the wide area network, which is uh, the concept of core network that we talked about in lecture one. So if you think about it, your core network consists of routers that are interconnected uh, to one another in a you know meshed kind of topology. And then at the edges of the core area network, we have uh, the uh, 
what is known as the edge routers. And these connect to other networks, for example, a neighborhood area network or a field area network, or perhaps a home area network. Okay, now we move on to the very important topic of network architecture. This is really the foundation of modern uh, computer networks and communication networks. So it's very important for you to get a very good understanding of what it means. What I'm going to do is I will first walk you through a conceptual example uh, to describe what the different aspects of network architecture is, and then we'll take it to um, how this is actually designed for communication networks. Imagine we have two companies, company A and company B, and we have two CEOs. Company A CEO would like to send a message to his counterpart at company B. This message, imagine, is related to a particular discussion that they had the week before about a particular project, and um, CEO A wants to mention uh, to his counterpart that his company is okay with their discussion um, and is offering certain terms, for example, is willing to invest $10 million over two years. Now, for the sake of this example, assume that uh, CEO A does not have a direct line of communication with CEO B. And number two, he doesn't really care how long it takes for the message to get to CEO B. All he cares about is the message gets to her correctly and uh, accurately. So what he does is he calls his secretary and tells his secretary that, hey, send this message uh, to CEO B. The message is regarding the conversation we had last week. Uh, it's a go with conditions, $10 million over two years. Now, the secretary doesn't really know what this message means exactly. She doesn't know what the CEO is referring to, what project is this, what conversation it was. All she knows, however, is that this is the message that has to go to CEO B. So what she does is she um, writes down this message somehow and uh, leaves it in the outgoing mailbox. Uh, then the uh, mailman of the company picks up the message and uh, delivers it to the courier. The courier takes this message and let's assume that at a certain uh, part of the way is ground transportation and then air mail and again ground transportation all the way until this uh, package goes to company B. At company B, the mailman of the company will pick up the letter um, and we'll see that this is addressed to the CEO. So we'll take it to the CEO's office. Um, the CEO has a secretary. The secretary picks up the letter and reads the letter to his boss and says, uh, this is a message from CEO of company A saying that regarding the conversation we had last week, uh, it's a go with conditions of $10 million over two years. Now, Let's go back uh, to this example and see what we can identify about the way the system works. The, uh, the secretary for each company provides a certain service to the CEO. That service is that uh, you dictate a message and I will make sure that I transfer it to the other side, to whatever your destination is. That's the service that the secretary provides to the CEO. The way this service is implemented, however, is not disclosed with the CEO. So from the CEO's perspective, it doesn't matter if the secretary wants to write down the, the message by hand or type it using a typewriter or type it on a laptop or use a tablet, for example. All he cares about is the message to be sent to his counterpart correctly. Likewise, when uh, the secretary places this message in the outgoing mailbox, uh, she doesn't really care how the mailman in the company will pick it up, whether they pick it up by hand, for example, or whether they have one of those carts where they pick it up, whether they pick it up at noon or at 2 p.m. She doesn't care about that as long as they pick it up and deliver it to the courier service. 
And again, from the perspective of the mailman, it doesn't really matter what, whether the courier service, for example, uses all ground transportation or ground transportation and airmail. Uh, remember that one of our assumptions was that the time it takes for the message to go through, it doesn't matter. Um, or as another example, if the courier um, service decides to move to all electric vehicles, again, from the perspective of the mailman of the company or the secretary or the CEO, that doesn't matter. The same arguments can be said about C, uh, Company B. Uh, the mailman of Company B doesn't really care how the message, how the packet um, has got there. All they know is that it has to be delivered uh, to the office of COB. Uh, the secretary of COB, again, it doesn't matter uh, to him how this uh, mail has been placed in the incoming mailbox. Uh, all he cares about is to receive that mail and then he will read it uh, to the CEO. And again, the CEO, um, she doesn't care if the message is being read to her uh, from a handwritten note, from a tablet, from a computer, or just verbally. So these are some observations we can, we can have. Every layer, for example, consider this layer. Every layer provides services to the layer above it. But the way these services are implemented are masked from the layer above. The service that the secretary provides to the CEO is you dictate a message and I will make sure it goes through to the other side, to the destination. But how I'm doing that, whether I'm writing it down, whether I am you know, typing it, that doesn't matter. I'm not going to discuss the way I'm implementing the service. Um, and because of this, um, these services, the way they are implemented, can be changed at any point in time as long as the service itself does not change. So, for example, the courier service might move to, um, I don't know, um, all electric vehicles and no airmail, for example. Or they may decide that from now on we want to, um, you know, take the mail using balloons. The way this, this service, which the service is, we will take the mail from this point to this point, the way the service is implemented doesn't really matter. It can change at any time. The secretary of this company may at some point decide that, you know what, I'm not going to put it in the mail anymore. There is a new technology called emails and whatever you say to me, I'm going to uh, type it as an email and I will email it to my counterpart. My counterpart will receive this email and will read it out uh, to his boss. So again, we can change the way services are implemented um, without affecting the way the system operates. So because this is important, I'm going to repeat these observations one more time. The key things in this diagram is that every layer provides services to the layer above it. These services are well understood. However, the way the services are implemented are masked from the layer above. The layer above does not need to know how these services are conducted. And because of this, the services can be implemented in different ways as long as the end result is the same. That's the whole concept behind network architecture. Now, this is something that uh, in the field of communication networking and computer networking, people have been working on for many, many decades. In fact, uh, the uh, work uh, started in the 60s and 70s and two kind of rival technologies uh, were proposed that we will talk about it uh, shortly. But before we get there, let's uh, finalize some definitions. A protocol is a set of rules that govern the format and meaning of messages that are exchanged between peer entities. Only peer entities understand the meaning of the messages because these are the only ones that know the protocol. When the CEO says, this is regarding the conversation we had last week, it's a go, $10 million over two years, the secretary doesn't know what this means. The mailman doesn't know what this means. The courier service doesn't know what this means. Even if they open the letter, they're not gonna uh, figure out what the meaning is. However, the CEO of company B uh, 
who is a peer to CEO of company A would exactly understand what the message means. Likewise, the two secretaries are peer entities and they understand the messages exchanged between them, but the other layers would not. We also had services, as I mentioned in the previous slide. This is a set of operations uh, that a layer provides to the layer above it. Now, this set of layers and protocols is known as network architecture. So here, as you can see, we have a layer N. It provides a service to layer above it, and it receives services from layers below. And then the peer entities, like two entities belonging to layer N, would have a particular protocol through which they communicate with one another. In the late 70s, the International Organization for Standardization developed what is known as the OSI reference model. OSI stands for Open System Interconnection. Uh, this was a seven layer model that was proposed for communication networking and computer networking. The layers consisted of application, presentation, session, transport, network, data link, and physical. Application layer was the layer that was responsible for generating the data. Presentation layer would encrypt that data if necessary, represent it in the right way. Session layer would generate a session between the two hosts, the sender and the receiver. A transport layer was responsible for the overall reliability of the communication network layer was responsible for determining the best route from the source to the destination. Data link's responsibility was to do local addressing and local transfer of the signal over a particular link. And of course, physical layer was responsible for receiving the message and placing it as a bit stream or byte stream rather uh, through the communication medium. Now, parallel to this, or in fact, um, about a decade before that, an effort had started at the US Department of Defense, known as ARPANET, which was a communication network that uh, was meant to provide connectivity between some uh, universities as well as some uh, federal institutions. Um, this uh, was initially over leased phone lines, uh, but later as they wanted to expand the network, they had to connect this network to other networks that were like radio networks or satellite communication networks. And in order to provide that interconnectivity between networks of different types like satellite, radio, and uh, leased phone lines, um, they developed what is known as a TCP IP reference model. This was a simpler model, uh, which consisted of four layers, application, transport, internet, and network in interface layer. Uh, there was a lot of competition between these two, so TCP IP and OSI, and eventually TCP IP won the battle because uh, it was uh, it had a, a more efficient design and uh, people were more familiar with it. So uh, by the time OSI was introduced, um, a lot of uh, you know network engineers and computer scientists and computer engineers were already familiar with TCP IP and were reluctant to move to this new model. Um, this of course had some uh, shortcomings, for example, uh, combining the physical layer and data link layer into what is known as the network interface layer, which in fact is an interface with the network. So there were some uh, modifications made to it, which brings us uh, to the model that we use in majority of communication networks today and the model that we will be using in this course. This model is known as the TCP IP protocol suite or also TCP IP five layer reference model. It consists of physical layer, data link, max sub layer, network layer, transport layer, and application layer. You notice that there are six entities here, but notice that MAC, which stands for medium access control, that's a sub layer that is often combined with data link layer. So in reality, we have one, two, three, four, and five layers. Uh, this is quite important and forms the foundation of a significant portion of this course. We will be moving up from the physical layer to the transport layer, discussing what each layer does. Uh, the different parameters, different design objectives, and all the uh, 
uh, ins and outs that are necessary for you to be able to design a communication network. So it's very important to memorize this diagram and the names and the order of the layers. Of course, uh, these layers do not appear in every single device. Uh, some devices only have capabilities for certain layers. Consider this case, you have a user that wants to communicate to another user through a communication path that takes it to a switch, then a router, then another router and the host. The first user has application transport network data link and physical layer. The messages are generated here, go down the protocol stack through the communication media up to the switch. When they get to the switch though, switch is a layer two device. So it only has physical and data link. It goes to the data link layer. The switch understands the outgoing port that the message has to be sent to. So it sends it back to the communication media uh, with the right port, through the right port. This will then go to a router, which is a layer three device, also has network layer. Um, and it goes from router, let's say router one to router two, uh, and then to the destination. When it gets to the destination, it goes up the entire stack uh, to the application layer. Uh, in certain textbooks, you might see a, uh, a diagram like this when they uh, break the physical layer into two subcomponents. That is to indicate situations where uh, you have a device, in this case, a router, that is connecting uh, two different communication media that are not similar to one another. So this way, we want to indicate that the physical layer and data link for the first medium is different from those of the second medium. Now, before we um, conclude this uh, presentation, um, an important aspect is the notion of protocol data unit. Any unit of data that is transmitted by a particular layer is referred to as a PDU or protocol data unit. Now, certain layers have specific names for their data units. Uh, if I redraw this here, we had the physical layer, uh, we had the data link layer, we have the network layer, we have the transport, and we have the application. Uh, the data that is generated at the physical layer, this is known as bits or bytes. The data associated with the data link layer is known as frames. Uh, the one generated at network layer is packets, and for transport layer is segments, and for application layer, we typically refer to it as application PDU. So in addition to memorizing and remembering the names of the layers and their order, make sure you memorize the names of the PDUs for different layers, because this is what we're going to be referring to. Now, the PDU of each layer has three parts. Um, it has a header, which essentially provides information about what is included in that data, it tries to explain the data. If you think of it, it's like a metadata um, for, for the data included in that PDU. Then we have the actual data, which we refer to it as the payload. And then we have the trailer. Trailer is something that we use for integrity checks. Um, in a lot of applications, this is a checksum, but there are other solutions as well. And we're going to talk about that later on. But essentially, this is an additional information that allows you to check this information, look at the entire message, and determine whether the message has been received in error or correctly. This entire PDU, meaning the header, the payload, and the trailer of an upper layer will be pushed down to the lower layer. But when it does, the lower layer doesn't understand what this message is. So it considers the entire data as a payload. Think about the previous example. When the CEO says, regarding the conversation we had last week, it's a go. $10 million over two years, the secretary doesn't understand what this information means. The CEOs do. The second CEO will know that when she receives that message, when the message says regarding the conversation we had last week, she, ex she knows exactly what conversation he is referring to. And when he mentions terms such as $10 million over two years, she knows what that means. So think of 
regarding the conversation we had last week, think of it as the header, which is trying to explain, look, this information, this data that I'm sending to you, what is it about? This is something that the peer entities understand, but lower entities, lower layers don't. So from the perspective of the lower layer, this entire thing is just a payload. The lower layer adds its own header and its own trailer and then pushes it down to the next layer. And the next layer does the same thing. Uh, you notice here that in this diagram, I am breaking the PDU for layer N into two parts before pushing them down to layer N minus one. This is not always necessary, but I'm trying to uh, show you that sometimes it is possible that the entire PDU that is coming from an upper layer is too big for the lower layer to be included in one PDU. So it would have to break it into part one and part two. Part one becomes the um, payload of the first message and part two becomes the payload of the second message. We are going to stop here for today. Uh, this is a list of references um, that um, I used throughout these slides. Um, and if you are interested in knowing more about the topics we discussed, uh, I encourage you to refer to these uh, textbooks. Uh, these two books in particular, the book by Tannenbaum and Kuros, uh, these have a lot of information about the network architecture that we discussed. Um, and I will be using them um, regularly during our discussion on individual layers.